All right, welcome to another Friday night episode of Keto Rocks Radio. And uh, this is a Friday after Thanksgiving, so hopefully everybody enjoyed their meat uh, and their keto-friendly... Oh my gosh, Brian has... Brian's got a junkyard full of full of meat. <laughs> Mark, what do you... Uh, Oh, well, be looking good. And to my left or right is uh, Brian Damage Foresight of Kicks. And uh, of course, I'm Jim Hobbs, and we have a special guest. We actually have the basis of Kicks, Mark Shanker, with us below on the screen. So, Mark, welcome back to Keto Rocks. Thanks for having me great, again. Great Appreciate to have it. you. Hope you. Oh, no. Gl always glad to have you. And uh, so, what kind of food do you typically have on Thanksgiving since we're uh, the day after? Um. You, you know, we do, uh, we do ham and turkey, just pretty much like everyone else, except uh, uh, this year, uh, I had a, a, a half of a ham that I had gotten from Snake River Farms out in Idaho. And, um, and so uh, that that's a is pretty, a pretty amazing place to get get meat from. And, um, and that's what that was, uh, that's going to be gone very quickly, because it's very, very good. <laughs> Now, do you have uh, do you, your family get together or do you uh, have friends over or is it just uh, you picking out on ham and, and turkey? Uh, well, my mom ha is uh, elderly, so um, it's going to be uh, always hard to visit her on a holiday. But uh, it was uh, my brother and I and um, and and that was pretty much it. We just kind of stayed away from her and, you know, and she only has one lung. So if uh, if she gets COVID, it's going to be bad news for her. So we're trying to keep her safe as best we can. And, um, you know, I got to take home the cherry pie. So I got this, you know, thing that's going to be taunting me until I either throw it out or give in. Um, I think uh, cherry pie was my dad's favorite at Thanksgiving. So I may have a piece in honor of him or two. <laughs> I think I'm just or doing the whole pie. I really am, you know. No, that's if you're gonna if if you're gonna eat it, at least eat it for a good reason. So right, that's uh right. that's that's not a bad reason to eat cherry pie right there. Yeah, talking about your mom, I I told her I saw her I saw her at the last kick show out there. If she I did not know she only had one lung. That is one brave woman to be out there in that cold that you guys played in uh, a couple of weeks ago in Frederick. Yeah, that was um uh you know she wants to go and um you know she has people that uh, around her that help her that live near her closer than I do. I, I live about an hour, 15 hour, 20 away. And my brother lives a little bit closer, but um, she has people around that can help her. And, and um, you know, she is, uh, she had polio when she was a child. So it's a little, a uh, little tough for her to get around, but, you know, she's been working those balance muscles her whole life. And man, I don't, I think if you bumped into her, you couldn't knock her over. <laughs> um, she's, she's a really, really tough lady, you know, lo losing her one lung to cancer and they had only given her a 5% chance to live. And, and, you know, here she is. And then she had two heart attacks about two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. My dad was still alive and, and she had to go, uh, take a helicopter ride to York hospital to their, uh, um, uh, thoracic trauma center or whatever they call it there. And, uh, so I don't, I don't, uh, I don't anticipate her going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> she's just so wow, tough. She's once, and, yeah, she's and, a yeah. strong individual for sure. She's tough. And she, you know, yeah. if she wants to go, there's no telling her you can't. She's <laughs> like, you know, that's it. I'm going, that's it. Figure out how to get me there. Make sure I get to come backstage and say hi. And, uh, and she likes to go and, you know, she's comfortable and she gets around. And, and uh, so it's not a, you know, it's not a hardship for her. Uh, at all. And she enjoys it. She needs to get out of the house. I mean, she's been, you know, stuck there for eight months and then for by herself. And then for four months before that, um, when my father died. So she's been, she's been alone almost exactly a year. Um, and so wow. she takes any chance she can to get out and a, a kick show or my other rush tribute, my rush tribute band, Sun Dogs, my other band, she'll come out to those as well. And, and you can't keep her away. She, she just won't, she won't hear it. Wow, that's a proud mom right there. Yeah, I got a chance to meet your brother. She he came by, stopped by our uh, where we were uh, parked, and 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 saw his four children, and 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 it was really cool to see 
someone, I don't know who took the picture, but of your mom and your four uh, nephew nieces there when you spotted them from the stage, it was pretty cool to see how you lit up when you saw them. So it was a pretty yeah. cool moment that someone captured. Yeah. And of course, you know, the thing, first thing I'm thinking about, I'm thinking, man, I bet it's really loud down there. Because <laughs> they were standing right in front of the PA. And uh, my brother, to his credit, bought them uh, hearing protection uh, devices beforehand. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that this is their first rock concert and they just have nothing but low end kick drum hitting them in the chest and, and the sensory overload must have been incredible, you know, so um, yeah, it was good to have them there. It's good to have everybody there. Awesome. Did you get a chance to talk to your, uh, your nieces and, and nephews after the yeah. show to see what they thought of the show? Well, no, not, uh, not after, but um, uh, I talked to them before, so I didn't get a chance to see them after my, my uh, brother wanted to get them out of there as quickly as possible and sort of minimize their exposure as well. So um, he didn't want them hanging out, talking to everybody. So I get it. No, to totally understand that. So let's talk about something that took place 35 years ago. Uh, the release of Midnight Dynamite. And uh, at that point, were you living in Virginia? Were you, were you a fan of Kicks back in 85, Mark? Actually, interestingly enough, uh, uh, I was in local cover bands. I lived in Maryland and um, I was in local, well, actually at the time we were all original band and um, uh, Kicks usually typically would have bands that were all original bands warm up for them. And so we were, we had a good, couple hours worth of original material and uh and i was just good friends with ronnie because his girlfriend lived right across the street and you know it's like two long-haired guys seeing each other across the parking lot hey you know <laughs> and so ronnie and i got to be really good friends back then so he you know i remember when he had uh when he left to go to new york to do midnight dynamite and he told me they were working with bo hill and you know of course i'd, I'd already heard the rat record and it sounded incredible it's still a great sounding record and I was so excited. I was like, man, this album is going to sound killer, you know? And so, so I was friends with Ronnie and I got to hear the, um, you, you know, the progress and, you know, how, how much Ronnie liked, you know, his guitar sounds were working out on there. And he, yeah, I do remember him, even though it was that long ago, believe it or not, I do have a pretty good memory, but I do remember him, you know, speaking highly of Bo and just saying how much fun they were having and all that stuff. So, um, so I, I, I couldn't wait for the record to come out because I knew Bo had done it and, and being a, of, uh, at, even at that time, I was an aspiring recording engineer and I uh, had my own studio and a little four track and a little eight track at the time. And um, uh, so, the, you know, the, his record sounded incredible and, and I just couldn't wait to hear kicks through Bo's uh, lens, so to speak. Awesome. Brian, what do you remember about recording the Midnight Dynamite? How long did it take you guys to record that album? Uh, it took a couple months because we, we went up uh, <clears throat> um, late uh, 84 and then we came back for the holidays. We took a break. We came back home and then we went back in January. So uh, yeah, it was at least two months, maybe even longer. I, I can't remember exactly, but um, yeah, it, it's cool when, you know, having that experience where you're just in one spot, like away from home for that long a time. And I remember it was sort of a transition period for, um, for everything, the music part of the band, the, the image part of the band, like everything was sort of transitioning at that point. And I remember it was cool to be stuck in New York city for a few months. Cause I was just like, anytime I didn't have to be at the studio, I was down in the village at the clothing shops and buying shoes and clothes and going to the thrift stores and, you know, putting my whole thing together, <laughs> like this whole new look. Um, so yeah, it was a cool experience. And, and of course, you know, Atlantic Studios is a legendary studio. I mean, that's where we did the first record too. But it's just, uh, it, that, that studio had such a cool vibe to it. And there was yeah. and the, cool, the cool thing about Atlantic Studios too is, well, like any studio, really, any na big name studio, there's just people in and out. Like you, like we were up there just sitting in the lounge and David Bowie walks by, sticks his head in and says, hello, boys. It's like, David Bowie. <laughs> so it's cool. You meet people like that at, at those places. Now, did you guys have any uh, 
guest musicians on that album when you guys recorded the first time around? Uh, well, we had, well, Mike Slamer did a couple solos. So that, that was it. Other than that, it was all, uh, well, no, Anton Fig. Anton Fig. I forgot about Anton. Yeah, he had to come in and do the last two songs, uh, Sex and Lie Like a Rug, because Jimmy had a, a pinched nerve in his neck and had to go have surgery. And, uh, you know, Bo only did... Did Bo play, did Bo play, did Bo play a little bit on that he, album himself? Well, I think he played keyboards, and he may, yeah. have, he may have thrown a couple guitars on here and there, but... Uh, yeah, Bo only did eight of the songs, and then the last two songs were um, Bill Dooley and Keith Lenton co-produced. And Keith Lenton played with uh, Anton in previous bands, so that's sort of the connection. That's how we got Anton in there. Cool. And then the the writers was mostly Donnie, and then the, the Kip Winger he did a he contributed to one of the songs on that album, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Bang Bang Balls of Fire. That was uh, uh, a ki one of Kip's riffs. I remember he gave Donnie a cassette, and it was just a two-part riff. And Donnie took it, and we, we made it into a song. So that was Kip's first like claim to fame. <laughs> first official writing oh, credit. Yeah, he says. yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I still remember when that album came out, because I remember that album was right before cds came out so it was still a vinyl it came out and i remember for me as a fan i just remember from you guys um recording that's when mtv was breaking and you guys recorded if i remember correctly and you can correct me if i'm wrong brian um i remember got invited went to the recording of midnight dynamite the video you guys filmed up in mount airy at uh at emmitsburg and mount st mary's Mount St. Mary's. That's I was it. there. Mount That's St. the only Mary's reason I know that. <laughs> yes, I was there too. I, I was. was there. We were both yeah. there. We were all there. <laughs> yeah, all I, four I, of I, us I remember. Were Go figure that. Yeah, that was crazy. We. Uh, <laughs> that was. That was. What are you going to say, Brian? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, that particular video. Um, I think the only one that the record company sprang for was Cold Shower. At the beginning, that was like the first single. And then uh, Midnight Dynamite was near the end. It was sort of like, uh, you know, it was starting to fizzle out. You know, the record had been played out and we'd toured like for a couple of years and then we wanted to sort of keep the thing going and the record company didn't want to put any more money into it. So we actually paid for that video ourselves. And, and the way we did it was we rented out that, um, that hall up there at Mount St. Mary's and we charged like five bucks for people to get in. <laughs> <laughs> and they basically paid for the video, so it worked out. Yeah, I remember. I remember the. Uh, I remember it was a Friday night because I coached high school crew, and we had a regatta the next morning. I had to be back at the boathouse at six a.m. And I remember Ooh. not getting out. Of the, yeah, I remember not getting out of of there till like two thirty. You guys played till it was two o'clock. You played late, and I remember not getting home to very early in the morning and getting about an hour of sleep, and then you know jumping down and. Uh, so I, re I remember that night well, because I was just exhausted uh, <laughs> to get to my regatta that, that next morning. But I, rem I remember the concert. You guys did the concert after you guys did a lot of the uh, the shots that you recorded. Yeah, that's and always so, rough to do. <laughs> Those are long yeah. days. So, so Mark, since we were all there, so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what makes the remix, what what. What inspired Bo to go, man, I want to redo this one. I want to redo this because I think I can make it better. What was what was his reasoning behind it? Or do you know? I do. Um, he uh, he had come to, so he did Fuse 30, of course, so with a total, total remix. But as you know, Fuse 30 wasn't his record. That was Tom Worman's record. And um, so he didn't have anything to do with it. And um, he, uh, we got him to remix that and that was a success um, for everybody. Uh, it gave the chance of band to, uh, the band a chance to celebrate their accomplishment with Fuse 30 and, and also, you know, put a really powerful mix on a record that I felt was, was sort of lacking. It just didn't sound as good as Midnight Dynamite. And it doesn't sound as good as Hotwire did afterwards. You know, Hotwire is a much better sounding record. so. It's kind of ironic that the 
one of the lesser sounding kicks record in records in my opinion is the one that shot them to you know the stratosphere so to speak and um so um after bo did fuse 30 we were playing in houston he came up and uh, drove up from his house in austin to see the band and hang out and after the show uh steve and jimmy and i were sitting in the hotel bar with him and we were just laughing and having a good time and um talking shit and um and and uh both said hey guys i gotta i gotta you know i got an idea don't 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 shoot it down and and we were like what you know and he says well um since this thing was so much fun and so successful um i'd like to take another crack at midnight dynamite and steve was like get out of here that record sounds amazing you're never gonna <laughs> the, what's the point of that and bo was, his answer was he was like i think i can beat it and we were still just like come on man you know and he's like no i think i can beat it and we were like, ooh, okay, well, let's see what happens. So then I knew there was an anniversary coming up uh, for Midnight Dynamite. And uh, since it's my favorite Kicks album, you know, you didn't have to twist my arm to try to put something in motion to help celebrate that for the rest of the guys at Kicks and to give them another opportunity to celebrate their accomplishments with what they did with that record and give Bo a chance to, you know, he really enjoyed going through his old notes because all the track notes are in all the there were like 12 tape boxes that we had digitized and they took pictures of all of the notes that were in the liners and or in the uh the storage boxes that they they stored the 24 track tapes in and so Bo got um you know he got to sort of relive his youth a little bit there and um uh you know he he would call me uh with different things you know he would say god I can't believe what, what I did to, in this one part, it's genius. And then <laughs> a half hour later, call me back and he'd be like, what moron produced this fucking record, you know? <laughs> so, so he had these extreme mood swings of, of things that he would dig out and find. And, and uh, you, you know, he admitted that he was confused as hell on, on some of the things he did. He's like, why would I ever do that? That is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. He says, I can't believe this has my name on it, you know? So, um, uh, so that's how it came about. You know, it was, it was, uh, you know, Bo planted the seed. And um, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's really great to, to, to give the, the uh, you know, my four brothers here a chance to celebrate their, their accomplishment with Midnight Dynamite. And, but it, it's really great um, also to give Bo a chance to you know, sort of relive his, his early mixing career and, and to, to sort of jump back into, you know, a time machine basically and see how he did things then versus how he does things now. And, you know, with another 35 years experience behind the mixing desk and, and you, you know, see how much, uh, um, how much he enjoyed that was a real treat to, to be a part of, you know, just get those daily phone calls from him and, and uh, you know, either he'd be, he'd be, joyous or mad you know <laughs> mad at himself you know for being stupid so did he utilize did he utilize did he utilize some of the new new technology in remixing this record i mean what well was, it's all what, it was all taken off a of tape and put into pro tools projects and uh so it's all digital it was all done with with pro tools in the box i think i think bo has some outboard gear that he likes last time i was at his house he had a nice nice collection of uh and i was just there right before the pandemic hit like the week before i was i was down at bo's house in austin just hanging out and um uh he, he's got a pretty nice little rack of uh you know not too much outboard gear he's not a he, he's he he can do really well with the plugins and he likes plugins and um so he um you know he he maximizes anything he can get his hands on and, and uh but he does have some you know some outboard gear that's 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 worth some money that's that's really you know that's really good stuff you know there's good stuff and he does right. use that as well but that's not the that's not analog is not his fallback he is he loves digital he loves what he can do with digital he loves plugins he loves what he can do with them and so um you know he so it was all digitized and sent to him on a hard drive the whole album so did any of the 
any new tracks recorded by like Ronnie or, or Jimmy or new vocals by Steve or new bass tracks by you and anything new recorded? No. Well, first of all, I would never, ever play bass on anything that somebody else played on on the original recording. And and I would not I wouldn't do that to to anybody. It's you know, I it, it's like the to me, the the integrity of the original recording is is uh, uh, sacred. You know, that's kind of a right. no, I respect usual that. word for it. I but, you know, we don't want to sort of bust down that um, that barrier and start thinking, oh, maybe if we fix this or that. So we didn't touch anything on Fuse. However, on this record, um, there was, you know, Brian, I mentioned earlier that Mike Slamer played the, the solo on um, Scarlet Fever. Yeah. Excuse me. And um, I think he did some, Brian, didn't he do some tail outs on Walking Away as well? Yeah, yeah. Just he a, initially did the, the whole out, but I kind of talked Bowen to let me at least do the front part so <laughs> yeah yeah so mike is on there and and you know bo knew that um uh that uh, and of course anton is on there too and so bo called me one day and he said hey listen you know there was um you know some bad feelings about scarlet fever he's like why don't we fix it while we have a chance and why don't you tell jimmy to um to go to go in the studio and play drums on these two songs that he didn't get a chance to play drums on back then. And so, um, so Ronnie went to, at first I called Brian because I thought Scarlet Fever was originally his solo. And he was like, no, it was supposed to be Ronnie's solo. And um, so Br Brian got in touch with Ronnie and Ronnie worked it out with uh, um, uh, Brad Divins at uh, Fixing to Get Mixing up in Hagerstown. And Brad, of course, as Kix fans will know is, um, was a guitar player with Brian on Cool Kids and also went on to form right. Rat Child America. And now he's a front of house guy with Enrique Iglesias running sound in soccer stadiums and arenas around the world. <laughs> and so Brad has a nice little studio in his home and um, Ronnie lives not far. And so they got together and they were able to record a new solo for Scarlet Fever. And um, Jimmy went into a recording studio with the guy, um, our mixing engineer from Rock Your Face Off, Scott Spellbring, and they recorded the drums to Sex and Rug and sent those down to Bo. And, you know, sonically, you can't really tell that there's a huge difference to, it still has a Bo, Bo Hill drum sound, uh, even though he, even though somebody else recorded it, but the mix is, is great. So, so those are the only two things that we touched. And, and I think that um, I personally, as an outsider, feel really cool about it because now that this re this remix this re-release is all the kicks guys are on it there's no no outsiders it's all kicks 100 percent. and i i love to be able to say that and and um i love that uh i was a part of it and, and able to to you know facilitate making that happen so now like you know there's no uh but you know anton played drums on a couple songs there's no butts it's all kicks well um, i gotta make one correction Mike Slammer still is on a couple tail licks going on on the out of walking away. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I, I had the opportunity to go back and fix that too, but it was like, nah, it's just it's on a fade out. I don't, it doesn't, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple, couple notes in there, yeah. but by and large, it's a, you know, it's a fully 99% kicks. Yeah. 99.9% .9 kicks. Yeah. And, and that's okay. I, I, I like that a lot. I think it's terrific. So, um, I hope they feel as good so, about it. As so, I do. <laughs> well, you're probably the only one that's listened to it so far. So why don't you tell yeah. Kicks fans what can they expect? <laughs> what can Kicks fans expect different in listening to this? They're listening to the old cassette, the first Midnight Dynamite, 1985. How is 2020 Midnight Dynamite going to sound? Well, it's uh, when you compare it side by side. There's it's a lot. Uh, you it, you you kind of realize that Midnight Dynamite had, uh, it was a little bit muddy, you know, that was the sound of the time was to throw a bunch of reverb and echo up there. And um, Steve's vocal wasn't mixed very loud. Um, it's sometimes, uh, it, you know, if you don't already know the words, you kind of have to strain to hear what he's saying. And um, uh, somehow that got by the record company because Bo Hill always tells me that no record company ever sent a record back for the vocals being too loud. So, um, so he was able to bring the vocals up and, um, and 
you could really hear a lot more character in Steve's voice in the way he was singing at the time. And the same thing with, with everything, really. You know, you hear Brian's guitar and Ronnie's guitar and all the, as Bo calls it, he took all the schmutz off it. So, so it's, uh, it's tight, it's punchy, it's powerful, um, it's clear. And I think it, I think it, um, uh, I just think it rocks more. Like it's like you listen to it and it's like, Jesus Christ, this is a rock record. This is a, and it, I already felt like that about Midnight Dynamite because this, again, it's my favorite record. So I already felt awesome about, you know, listening to any song on that record, you know, and, and now it's just, uh, you know, it's times 10. I mean, it really is, you know, you can hear um, some of the, you know, as Bill call, uh, says, Bill, as Bo calls them, he calls them silly bits. And <laughs> they, they come out more on the record, uh, on the on the remix, you know, because they're his silly bits. And so he knows they're there and and he was able to highlight those and bring those up. So you, you hear a lot more uh, details that you wouldn't hear before. Um, the guitars are, are um, you know, they sound like they did coming out of the amp, you know, and they just are just hot and i mean cooking hot it, it's really great so yeah. that that's what they can expect to hear yeah i did get to awesome. hear um, i did go to one of those um like itunes or something where you can hear a sample so i heard little samples of some of the songs and i noticed i noticed a few things that weren't there before that it's like oh cool you put that in <laughs> so i can't wait to hear the whole thing so so mark you said out of all the kicks CDs or albums that that Midnight Dynamite was your favorite, is that correct? I hear Without you correctly. Question. Yeah, because I, okay. I after I heard the Rat Records, I became a, a big fan of Bo Hill's um, engineering and mixing and producing work, and so um, you know that I, I think the Rat albums set up the the Kicks album. You know, like Bo really fell into a groove with Midnight Dynamite, and and to this day, if you look at all of the artists that Bo has worked with, you know, um, he will still tell you that his favorite album that he ever did is Midnight Dynamite and his favorite drummer that he ever worked with was Jimmy. And Bo's done Roger Daltrey, he's done Stevie Nicks, he's done, you know, all of the Rat records, all of the Warrant records, all of the Winger records. And his favorite is still our little, our little gem, Midnight Dynamite, you know, that's his, <laughs> that's his favorite record. And I think that speaks volumes to the the, the, the type of uh, groove that he was in at the time and, and the, 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 the vibe that they probably had in the studio together, the guys with Bo, because they always speak that it was the best time they had in their lives. And Brian can speak to that better than me, but I, I hear that over and over again when, when they talk about working with Bo. So um, well, I, did, I did get a nickname out of it. So. That's right. <laughs> Tell the story about, about your nickname. That's yeah. Let's, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, about that. let's hear that, Brian. Well, yeah, I know I've told this because I've been doing interviews this whole week. So I, this story comes up every time. But uh, uh, yeah, we, you know, the, the recording session would end, say, like 10 p.m. at night. And then we just all go out, you know, to some bar somewhere and get hammered. And, and uh, so the next day we'd all show up at the studio. I'd always have a hangover. And um, just one day I had this like particularly like bad hangover and I was just feeling awful and I go into the into the room there where the console is and there's a couch in front of the console and, and then the window that looks out into the studio so I go around and I lay down on that couch I'm just laying there moaning and Bo's doing whatever he's doing and every time he'd stop the music he could hear me down there moaning on that couch. <laughs> so at some point he gets up and walks around and, and he just stands there looking at me. And I remember like, like opening one eye and looking up at him and, and he looks at me and, and he used to call me brain. That was his pet name for me. It was, it was like Brian with the A and the I reversed. He'd always go brain. Hey brain. So this day he comes over and he's looking at me. He goes, he goes brain. He goes, we should call you brain damage. And I remember thinking, as soon as he said that, I go, yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so, it, it stuck. <laughs> so did he record those moans and use that on the uh, sex track? Yeah, he should have. No, I, I don't think they, were, they, were, they weren't wearing good moans <laughs> for that. <laughs> 
Well, Brian, what's your favorite album that you guys recorded? Because I think, I mean, Midnight Dynamite is one of my favorites too. Because it would, it just, it it was a uh, a great explosive album that just one of those ones from top to, to bottom that you just a cassette you put in your car and drive around town and you just blasted it because it was a great. It's like an ACDC back in black album. It's like every track was good. It was loud, and it and it had great meaning, especially back in 1985. At least for me, it did. Well, I was I always thought that that was like I mentioned before the transition. That's sort of where we sort of fell into our thing. Like um, before that, we were sort of fishing around for a sound, and it all kind of came together for Midnight Dynamite, and that sort of set us off on our direction. Um, and I've compared it to like say the Stones in in um, Beggar's Banquet. Not that, that that it's the same kind of record, but. Beggar's Bank for the Stones was the same thing. That's when they found their sound. So I felt like Kicks found their sound on Midnight Dynamite. So you know, yeah, I mean, I think that that album, then Blow My Fuse, and then uh, Hot Wire. I think those were just like three, three, three of the best albums of bands released in consecutive order. I mean, they were just three really rocking albums. Um, and it, you'd be, I, I would tell you, I would, it'd be tough to put any other band's three consecutive albums against that trio right there. Cause that trio is very tough to beat in my opinion. I agree with that. You know, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's too bad that, you know, Hotwire didn't come out like right after that because Hotwire is a well-produced, I'm with Mark on that one. I think it's just, that's another super album that you guys put together. Yeah. That's and, actually uh, my favorite. You know, yeah. Hotwire is a is a great. I mean, it's 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 good from top to bottom. I, I think all three of those are. You can just put those in a in a jukebox and hit mix, and there's not going to be a bad song that you're going to you know be listening to. So, yeah, I agree with that. That's off to you guys. So, Mark, so tell everybody how they can go uh, go get this new remix of Midnight Dynamite Relit. Um, you can go to our online store. So go to um, kicksband.com. And you can click on, um, is it merch or store? It's, I forget what it is, but you can click on the merch or the store link at the top and that'll take you to our online store and you can actually pre-order it right now. Uh, and digital is available um, on iTunes, Spotify and Apple Music um, right now. And shortly after the CD is available on our website, um, when it starts shipping, then we'll have an Amazon link as well. So you'll be able to order the, um, uh, you'll be able to order the physical product off of Amazon uh, soon after uh, the physical release is available on our website. Awesome, awesome. Well, I know I know. I placed my order a couple of weeks ago, so I'll be glad when, uh, when mine comes in because I definitely uh, bought a couple. So some uh, friends actually I won't say on the air, but some of the, uh, there'll be great stocking stuffers from people who uh, are in our family who are big kicks fans. So cool. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So awesome. So uh, do you guys have any upcoming concerts in, uh, I know you guys got a lot of stuff in 2021, anything that surprised jumped out in uh, 2020 before the end of the year, or just everybody's got to wait to 2021. So far our calendar has been wiped clean, but, uh, but the fact that it's, empty you know it leaves room for like these little pop-up gigs like that drive-in thing that was, we had like what two weeks notice yeah on that? like two weeks notice on that like nothing so yeah so you never know we're hoping for some more pop-up gigs here and there somebody can figure out a way to have a show safely and um and hopefully it'd be nice to get one one in november and one in december and one in january and one in february if we could get if we could get one nice gig a month that would be really good and then we get back yeah. on our <laughs> You know, depending on how the vaccine uh, distribution goes and how quickly it gets out to the general public after the frontline workers are taken care of, um, hopefully we won't have to push back any gigs in February and March. So, um, but it's looking like that's about the timetable for um, what I've been reading for for either of the two leading vaccines to start getting into the hands of the general public about that time. So maybe everybody will breathe a sigh of relief and, and we'll be able to go forward with, uh, you know, uh, kind of a new normal, but at least we'll be able to play our shows that are booked. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we do. No, no, I, no. Think, well, I think the, the next actual one that's on, on the calendar is in February, but we'll see what happens when we get there. 
I have a feeling that's going to get pushed a little further. But. Maybe. Hmm. That's that's kind of on the borderline there, isn't it? It's, yeah. Let's hope not, though. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hope for the no, best. It's all, po all, positive, it all positive thoughts. All positive thoughts. Mark, what, how did you like? I know both your bands played at the at Frederick Drive-In, right? Correct? Both Kicks and your other band? Oh, played, uh... no. We played... Um, my Rush Tribute band, Sundogs, played uh, the Tally Ho Theater the week before in Leesburg. And we did okay. uh, we did two nights, and it was a social distance show. And my mom came to one of those too. We were talking about my mom earlier, and um, she came to one of those too. And so we did, you know, we did a two nighter there, and it was great. They did they did everything right. Social distance. Everybody's wearing a mask. All the staff is wearing a mask. Um, where the food prep was, everybody gets contactless ordering, contactless pickup, and um, you know they. They uh, uh, have, a, you know, obviously um, Sun Dogs is, is cheaper than Kicks, so they can afford to have us in there and, um, you know, have sell a couple hundred tickets. And, and uh, well, we sell that place out too. Kicks sells it out and so does Sun Dogs. But um, it's, it's nice that for, for me that Sun Dogs fits in, in sort of the Goldilocks zone where we're not too expensive and not too cheap. And so, Promoters can still buy the band and and still make a little bit of money and not break any rules and not risk anybody's safety. So, um, so it's kind of nice to be in that spot, especially with the Kicks calendar wiped clean. We're getting we're also getting a lot of uh, uh, pop up gigs. So, um, so yeah, we're 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 uh, we didn't play a drive in, but we played the week before. So I, I was grateful for that. That was nice. Well, what, what was your thoughts on the drive? And I was telling Brian, it was actually my best venue I've ever seen Kicks plan because it was just such a great place to be able to park. We, we did, a, you know, brought a table, spread it out, and truly got a chance just to relax, ate a keto-friendly meal, and uh, enjoyed the show. I thought it was awesome. I, I thought, um, uh, I, I didn't, it, it was weird, but awesome because we've never done a drive-in before. You know, we've never done any kind of show where people you see car nothing but cars you know <laughs> so um it was uh it was interesting um the crowd was quite far away so it was kind of hard to get um you know really get a feel for the feedback that you're that you're getting because we have in-ears that that kind of totally block our hearing so we can only hear what's coming through our mixer sometimes we can hear the crowd but they were far away so it was kind of like you know are we getting over and then of course there was the temperature issue um but we had heat on stage and uh, they, they had these uh, tubes that were blowing heat from these giant kerosene heaters on the side of the stage. And it was, it was comfortable. You're able to go up there and warm your hands up, but um, you know, my bass would get really cold and the strings would get cold and that it's like touch, putting your hand on a cold fender, your hand is actually going to get cold. So I got a little cold um, at a couple of spots and, and uh, felt pretty sluggish, but uh, I don't think anybody noticed, but I, I noticed. Um, but it, it was, it was weird to see all the cars out there, but I'll tell you what, it was good. What I can see is that even though people were 20 feet apart, they were still wearing masks and that was great to see. So I, I was real, uh, I was real pleased with that. That was a, you know, people are trying to do the right thing. It's great. Well, well, it was a, it was a great venue and that high definition screen that was oh. above the stage that people could see for miles away. I mean, that was killer. And Brian was telling me it was designed for uh, to be able to show movies during the daylight hours, which makes right. a lot of sense because that's that's the clearest screen I have ever seen. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. That was looked like a forty foot by thirty foot screen. It was pretty large. Yeah, it was cool. They put that yeah, uh, the, the ceiling on the stage was was clear too. So you, if you're right under the stage, you could still see the screen through the, the roof. Yeah, that's, that was great. that's cool. Yeah, so I was telling Brian, I sure hope they bring you guys back when it's warmer temperatures, because it's you know I know it's cold for you guys. It was also cold for the guys, you know, for us being out there, you know, sitting. But it was it was well worth it. I mean, people are starving for live entertainment, uh, especially kicks uh, being played in their home ground in their backyard. So I had to be a, it was a pretty cool night. Yeah, I was thinking the other day, like, what's the you know, when, so we, when we played, it was about 50, 51, 52 degrees. And I'm thinking, so what is the first week in March 
or even the end of February that it's going to be that temperature again. And we'll just, we should just schedule a gig there now so that when it gets, because we know we can handle playing in 50 degree temps with some heat. So, you know, we figure out when the weather changes, if we get, you know, schedule that gig right now, that would be amazing. I was thinking about that the other day. It's like, God, when does it actually get a little bit warmer? It's sometime in the beginning or middle of March. Sometimes you see, you know, 50, 55 degree days. And I don't know. That was just a thought I had. I was like, well, yeah, if we could just book it now, you know, <laughs> have something yeah. to look forward to that we know will work. That's awesome for the fans. Now, does the band have any uh, plans to just play the whole Midnight Dynamite album with this new release like you guys did with Blow My Fuse? Um, I don't know. They, we, I don't think, I, don't, I think we probably wouldn't do Walking Away. And um, Steve's not really excited to do Cold Shower because it's so high. Um, and he, uh, he's like, he's kind of tired of playing that song at this point, I think. But I, I get that. But who knows? I, I mean, we don't have plans to do front to back, but I, you know, me personally, I hope we get to throw in, um, you know, Scarlet Fever or Cry Baby or, or both of them or, you know, because we've never in this version of the band, we've never played those two songs. So um, yeah, I'd be, have to relearn them. <laughs> I actually, yeah, so, yeah, of course. Cry, Baby, Cry Baby, we never played live. We, we, it was a new song going into the studio too. So we kind of put it together in the studio. So we played it on the record in part, you know, in pieces like you do. So we've never actually played it. Oh, okay. That didn't come out of the closet on the Midnight Dynamite tour thingy? I don't think so. Yeah. No, I don't think we ever played that one. Yeah. Not that I can recall. That's one of that's a, one of my favorite songs on the record. I think that song is so cool. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. It's, uh, it's a little, little bit more difficult, I think, to do all of Midnight Dynamite than it was to do Fuse. Because I think we were playing most of Fuse at one point or another. Anyways, I think we... What do we have to do, Brian? Learn two songs that we never played before and that was it or something? Well, actually, Piece of the Pie was the only song we've never played. All the other oh, okay. songs we okay. played at some point. Okay. So. Yeah. So that was, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer with Fuse, but um I'm I'm willing to do anything. It's up to the it's up to the rest of the guys if they want to play it all or not. You know, I I don't care either way. I I love the songs and I, I would love the opportunity to to we had such a good time doing Fuse front to back and yeah, you could tell the fans really dug it, and it was a, and it was special for people with their memories and what they were, you know, listening to the cassette front to back all the way back in 1988, you know, and and uh, so so yeah, I would love to play it front to back, but um, I, it's up to those guys. I would keep an open mind. It's just I, I'm so lazy about learning songs that I forgot <laughs> how to play, but. <laughs> But I was like that going into the Blow My Fuse thing. But then after we did it, it was like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, I, I was dreading Piece of the Pie. It was like, oh, man, I got to learn that song. But after we after we had it down and had played it a few times, it was like, oh, this isn't so bad. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it'd probably be the same if we did it with this one, too. Yeah. You're just a creature of habit, Brian. That's I it. know. I want to take the easy way out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm a creature of habit too. It's just, but someone inserts a new routine for me. And once I do it, I don't want to change that routine either. So I, I, I totally get it. Yeah, it's like, so, like, and you guys have your. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that, Brian? I was going to say, like, uh, an example is Rock and Roll Overdose. Every, you know, we hate, Ronnie and I hate playing that song on stage, but once we start playing it, we can play it. And then, then we stop playing and it's like, oh, you know, I want to keep playing it so I don't have to relearn it every time, you know? <laughs> but well well mark well i appreciate you coming on and give us your time and your input thanks for thanks for sharing and thanks for uh for coming on and joining us once again uh what uh before you leave though what uh what food projects are you working on i always ask brian this question so what uh what what's your favorite smoking uh meat that you have uh on your traeger uh, uh you love cooking well, I mentioned uh, a little earlier before we actually went live that uh, I had bought some um, I had bought some Wagyu beef hot dogs from a place called Snake River Farms in Idaho. And um, uh, those were amazing. And I, I really, really do not like hot dogs. I think they're gross. But I figured, hey, if it's Wagyu beef, it'd probably be pretty good. And, it, and they're 
amazing hot dogs. It is just astonishing how good they are, especially when you smoke them for 15 or 20 minutes first and then sear them, you know, and uh, wow, what a, what, what a treat that was. And then I found a, um, through uh, um, a mutual friend, uh, Sean Frazier, he hooked me up with a place around here, uh, the people that live close to Northern Virginia. Um, there's a place here called Cottonwood Farms and it's a farm to table um, butcher. They, they raise all their, it's all grass fed cows. And, and uh, so I placed an order with, uh, with, with them and, and they deliver it right to your house. They're in, they're in Southern Virginia near Charlottesville. Okay. And, um, and uh, so uh, Cottonwood Ranch is, that meat was outstanding in every way. It was, it was, uh, um, you know, the, and the nicest people in the world, you know, they're, they're farmers. So, you know, have you ever known a mean farmer, you know? <laughs> so, so the guy was super nice and, and, uh, and he, um, and, and that meat worked great on the Traeger. Um, you know, thanks. To, I got to say, give a shout out to John Dudley, uh, the, the famous uh, archery guy for um, hooking me up with the, the, the Traeger and then Tyler from Traeger for hooking the rest of the band up with okay. the Traegers. They, they, uh, uh, we're eternally grateful to both you, John and Tyler for that. Cause, uh, it has changed my life significantly. Yeah. I, I cook most of my meals on that thing. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Same here. But other than that, yeah, you Mark, know, you're like the mail, you're like, you're like the mailman now you said, right. No matter rain, snow or sleet, you're out there cooking on that Traeger. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No question. Actually. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking about, I got a flank steak that's been sitting in there for a little while that I've been eyeballing. I might cook that tomorrow um, after the leftovers run out. So um, uh, I'm excited about that. And, and uh, so I kind of, it's like you look forward to your meals in the way that I used to look forward to oatmeal cookies, you know, <laughs> it's like, or chocolate in the pantry, you know, it's like, ah, oh, I got that, you know, I got that thing there that I get to eat, you know, so so I'm, I'm, I'm got a, I got a flank steak coming up and um, uh, what else I got out there? I got a, I think I have some, some fillets from Cottonwood Ranch uh, that, that uh, I've had before and they're outstanding. Um, and I'm going to cook those, I think coming up. So, you know, you start thinking about it like a, you know, like a, uh, like a drug, like I need some, I need some meat off the trigger <laughs> tonight, or I'm just gonna, I won't be able to take it, you know, so. <laughs> Just, so those just, are my plans. Just one for... more piece. Just one. Just one more piece. Just... Right. Right. Brian, you cook. You cook. You cook the tomahawk the other day. I know you didn't show any videos, but you cooked the tomahawk, didn't you? You and I were talking. You said you had one. Yeah, I, I stopped by uh, Kroger for something the other day, and I always have to go by the meat counter just to see what they have. And <laughs> and they had this one tomahawk. It was like you know that thick, and it had like this big chunk of fat on the side. And I'm like. It just, it was exceptionally, sec, exceptional looking. And uh, I wasn't planning on buying anything and it was on sale too. So I, I just grabbed it, just the one and, uh, and, and threw it in my refrigerator, but I had a couple of other things lined up already. Cause I, I'll pull stuff out of my freezer and put it up top so that it, it thaws out. So the, the tomahawk sat in there for a couple of days and, and I, it was like to justify eating that huge giant thing. I had to do like this intense workout. So the one day I did my biggest workout was when I ate that, that tomahawk. So <laughs> I had to awesome. do like, a, awesome. you know, the, the squats or the, the deadlifts or one of those workouts that I hate. <laughs> it was a leg, it was a leg day, huh? So you rewarded yourself with a tomahawk. Yeah. And I couldn't finish it all. It was, uh, it was over two and a half pounds. It was like 2.63, I think, but, uh, Lord. <laughs> yeah i got i got about two-thirds of the way through and i was like oh, i just can't i i'm gonna have to save the rest of this and it was good and then the next day i just sliced it up cold and it was still good like every piece i ate it was just like mm. i love that stuff yeah I, i'm like i told you I, i'm loving taking you know my leftover i cook a bunch of ribeyes or a bunch of new york strips and the leftover new york strips i've been slicing them really thin through my meat slicer and then putting that on the uh the grilling on the on my grill um with uh, my flat top with butter and onions and green peppers and, oh, the and griddle. garlic and and then the griddle yes yeah, so thank you that's it the griddle yes and uh wow 
that's good. So now, you know, I cook a bunch of steaks, smoke a bunch of steaks at once. And then the leftover steaks I actually use to make a steak and cheese, green pepper, onion bowl. And uh, wow. that is that delicious. Good. Yeah, I love yeah, my... I got the I meat slicer. My, I was going to say, I love my new griddle too. That's that's the other thing, that Blackstone. Oh. Yeah. It, it's a new experience. Now I smoke the steaks on the Traeger, then I pull them off the Traeger and throw them on that griddle and... and you know, and sear the outside of them. It gets that crust. Like I put, I throw a big thing of butter on that griddle, and then throw the steak on top of it. Ah, oh, so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in love. It's a great combo to have. So you can have a Traeger and a, and a, and a, and a, a gr griddle. Uh, gr yeah. So am I saying it right again? I, I get so yeah. confused on that yeah, thing. Griddle, yeah. I love it. Yeah. So anyway. Well, Mark, thanks for having you on. Brian, I'll let you close us out. And everybody, thanks for joining us again. And uh, get out there and, and go to the uh, Kicks website and purchase yourself your the new re-release of the remix of Midnight Dynamite called Relit. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys on the road in 2021. And I'm sure everybody will be looking forward to me. Hey, everybody makes a great stocking stuffer. So get it for your family, your friends and surprise them with a new uh, a new memory from 1985. Yeah. All right. You know, listen to the record and eat your meat. And eat your meat. And wear your mask. <laughs> well, not while you're eating. All meat. right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys take care. A great Friday. Great weekend. And we'll see you guys next Friday. Take care, All everybody. Right. Thanks. See ya.